Hey guys, welcome back to Med School Moose. If this is the first time you are finding my channel, welcome. I normally make videos that are high yield for things like USMLE Step 1 and Comlex Level 1. But that being said, I am an emergency medicine doctor by training, so I wanted to make videos that would be relevant to emergency medicine, which is why I decided to make this. So these videos are going to be high yield facts for the board exams. I think this is going to be really awesome for people looking for material like this. I know it gets difficult reading Tintinales and doing Rosh questions all day, so hopefully this will be just another method you can use for studying when you're preparing for your exams. Just a quick FYI, a couple things. This information is going to be hopefully high yield for the in-training exam that residents take uh, every February, I guess. Uh, but it's also going to be high yield for the ABEM qualifying exam that you take after residency. So hopefully this will be useful for a lot of different people. The information that I'm presenting may vary between study resources. If you are finding different information in the resources you are using, I would recommend just sticking with that to be consistent with your studying. The information may also vary throughout time. Things may change depending on when you're watching this. Some of the information may be outdated, so just be aware of that as well. So just a quick rundown of these videos. It's kind of like a flashcard thing that I do. I'll put the question or the trigger phrase or the buzzword or whatever it is on the left side, give a quick second, and then I'll put the answer on the right side. I try to use different colors. I know it can be difficult staring at screens and textbooks and everything all day, so I try and put a little bit of brightness in there just to kind of engage your brain a little bit more. So enough talking about all that. Let's go ahead and get started. The first high yield fact here is going to be the chest x-ray findings for pneumoconiosis. And in this case, it's going to be small, rounded opacities in the upper lobes. The important thing to know here is that they may give you a chest x-ray that has these findings and ask you for the diagnosis on the exams, or they may just give you this verbal, uh, this readout in the vignette of small rounded opacities and want you to identify it that way. So really important to know both ways, but pneumoconiosis on chest x-ray, you're going to see small rounded opacities in the upper lobes. Next after that, the chest x-ray findings for asbestosis. These are things that we don't really commonly see in the emergency department, but we need to know them for the exam. So asbestosis is going to be pleural plaques and coarse honeycombing. If you see that pleural plaques and coarse honeycombing, they describe it like that on the exam, definitely want to be thinking about asbestosis. Next one here, what is cold water immersion syndrome? Pretty intuitive if you're looking at the name there, but it's sudden exposure to very cold temperatures or very cold water that can lead to cardiac arrest. And this is something that we may see in the department all the time. So cold water immersion syndrome, sudden exposure to very cold temperatures can lead to cardiac arrest. Next one here is a kind of a fill in the blank. Blank should be the initial consult for Borhav syndrome. This may vary at different institutions, but what I've seen on the boards that they're looking for is thoracic surgery. It's not GI, it's going to be thoracic surgery as the initial consult for Borhav syndrome. Next one here, the organism transmitted by reptile bites. You definitely, definitely need to know this. You're going to need to know the organism. You're going to need to know how to treat it. And in this case, it's going to be salmonella. So if anybody's bitten by a reptile on the exam, the microbe that you really need to be worrying about is salmonella. Next up, the difference between type 1 and type 2 necrotizing fasciitis or necrotizing soft tissue infection. This is something that we don't really need to know in the department, but we need to know for the exam. So type one is going to be polymicrobial, and this is a combination of aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. This is the more common form of necrotizing fasciitis or necrotizing soft tissue infection. It's type one. But there is a type 2, and that's typically caused by strep pyogeny. So you definitely want to know the difference. I have seen in some questions they ask, what is the cause of type 2 necrotizing fasciitis? And if you don't know that information, it's really easy to get wrong, but hopefully you'll get it right after seeing this. Type 2, strep pyogenes, and type 1 is polymicrobial. Next one here, the treatment for ascending cholangitis. This is going to be biliary drainage typically with ERCP. The big reason that they want you to know this on exams is because without intervention, the mortality of ascending cholangitis is nearly 100% within 72 hours of diagnosis. So patients can get very sick very quickly. If you have a patient on the exam, fever, jaundice, right upper quadrant pain, all of those concerning things, and it seems like they have ascending cholangitis, they are going to need biliary drainage, and that is typically going to happen with ERCP. Seboric dermatitis, newly diagnosed in a young adult, should raise suspicion for what? In this case, we should be aware of immunodeficiencies, such as HIV. So if you have a 20-something-year-old patient, they're relatively healthy, have no medical problems, and they're coming in with seboric dermatitis kind of out of nowhere, and there's no clear cause for it, you really want to be thinking about these immunodeficiencies, something like 
HIV. Next one here, what is the mechanism of action of trans <clears throat> Next one here, what is the mechanism of action of tranexamic acid or TXA? This is something that we're starting to use in the emergency department a lot more. So how does it work? Well, it's going to inhibit clot lysis by preventing conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. So by doing that, it prevents conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. Clots are going to be able to form and they are not going to be broken down, which is why we like to use it in the department for things like epistaxis. So definitely need to know the mechanism of action of TXA. And then on the flip side, what is the mechanism of action of desmopressin acetate or DDAVP that we sometimes use in the department? There's two important things you need to know here. It's going to induce the release of von Willebrand factor and it's going to increase factor eight activity by up to two to three times. One of the important things that you may see on exam, uh, an indication for using DDAVP is if you have an end-stage renal disease patient with bleeding, because they're end-stage renal, they have uremic platelets. Their platelets are dysfunctional. So giving them DDAVP to allow for these mechanisms may help with those issues. So definitely want to know the mechanism and the application for DDAVP. Treatment of a brown recluse spider bite. This is something that is always, always on the exam. So you definitely need to know this. This is going to be supportive care plus a tetanus vaccine. Previously, Dapsone used to be used. It is no longer recommended. If you're seeing it on the exam, probably shouldn't be seeing it because there's some controversy there. But if you do see it on the exam, it is more likely a trap. Treatment of a brown recluse spider bite is primarily supportive care. And of course, you always want to give them that life-saving tetanus vaccine. Next up here, etiology of a scuba diver suffering a seizure at depth. This is going to be on the exam. I know you guys have seen questions about this constantly. Everyone on these exams is always scuba diving for some reason, and we need to know where it's happening, when it's happening, if it's when they descended, when they ascended, how long after, all these different things. So a scuba diver suffering a seizure at depth when they are descended, when they are in the water, is going to be due to oxygen toxicity. On the flip side of that, the etiology of a scuba diver suffering a seizure after ascending, they are out of the water, they are up back on the boat, and then they have a seizure that is going to be an air gas embolism. It's really silly stuff for most of us, but you definitely want to know it because there will be questions on the exams for this. Next one here, what intervention has been shown to have an absolute risk reduction of mortality in acute myocardial infarction? I have seen practice questions that are labeled just like that. They will ask you straight up. And the answer, of course, here is going to be that always reliable aspirin 324 or 325 milligrams. That has an absolute risk reduction of mortality in acute myocardial infarction, which is why we always want to make sure those patients that are at high risk are getting four aspirin if they're having chest pain. After that, about 30 to 50% of patients with reactive arthritis also have blank. This is going to be the HLA B27 haplotype. There's a couple different diseases that are associated with this, but one of the important ones that you need to know is going to be reactive arthritis. If you see that, you want to be thinking about the HLA B27 haplotype. Next question here, what is the treatment of choice for impetigo? In this case, it's going to be topical mupiracin. Listen to that again, topical mupiracin, not oral or anything. It's going to be topical mupiracin for impetigo. After that, what is the serotonin syndrome triad? They ask about tox all the time on these exams. You definitely want to know the constellation of symptoms that'll make up serotonin syndrome. In this case, it's going to be altered mental status, increased neuromuscular activity, and that itself may represent hyperreflexia or myoclonus, and then autonomic instability. Those are the three things that if you have a patient that is displaying that, you want to be thinking about serotonin syndrome. Blank is the fastest and most effective method to rewarm hypothermic patients. When these patients come in, they've been out in the cold overnight, they're found down in the snow, what have you. There's a lot of different things that we're going to try to rewarm them, right? We're going to try bladder irrigation, we may put in chest tubes, we may do a lot of different things. But the fastest and most effective method to rewarm these hypothermic patients is going to be ECMO. So you definitely want to know that. How does metformin cause lactic acidosis? This is something that we're taught all the time in medical school, right? If you see lactic acidosis, you want to be thinking about metformin, see if they're on metformin. How is that happening? Well, it's actually because metformin is converting intestinal glucose into lactic acid, and that can sometimes get into the bloodstream. So that is how metformin is causing lactic acidosis. Next one here, what is the treatment for PCP or PJP pneumonia in an AIDS patient with a sulfa allergy? So this is one of those second order questions, right? The primary treatments for PCP pneumonia, you can't use them. The patient has a sulfa allergy. Now what are you going to do? In most cases that I've seen, the answer is going to be pentamidine. So it's a little bit out there, maybe not as high yield as some of the other things on here, but if you have a patient, they have AIDS, they have PCP pneumonia, and they have a sulfa allergy, 
the medication you want to be using is pentamidine. One other important thing that you want to note with that is the most common side effect of pentamidine is hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. So if you see pentamidine, know that that is one of the associated risks. What is the treatment for intussusception? We're moving over to the pediatrics here a little bit. So if you have a young patient that has intussusception, it's typically going to be an air enema. The only caveat to that is if the patient has peritonitis. If the patient has signs of peritonitis, an air enema is an absolute contraindication for treatment of intussusception, and you're going to need operative repair. So you really want to know that important caveat for treating this condition. Next up, balanitis with candidiasis in a healthy male should raise suspicion for what? In this case, it's going to be undiagnosed diabetes. So you may run into these vignettes on the exam. Young patients, they're healthy. They have seborrheic dermatitis. You want to be thinking about immunodeficiencies such as HIV. You have a healthy male with balanitis with candidiasis. You want to be thinking about undiagnosed diabetes. During what time frame does postpartum thyroiditis occur? This is one that we need to know. It's going to be within the first year after delivery. A lot of conditions can happen in that postpartum phase and postpartum thyroiditis can occur one year after delivery. Next up, what is the most common cause of epiglottitis? I think most of us probably know this by now. It is going to be staphylococcus and streptococcus. It used to be haemophilus influenza, but the haemophilus vaccine has definitely changed that. So now the most common cause of epiglottitis is going to be staph and strep, as we see so many places in medicine. Blank is the most severe effect of a sea snake bite. A sea snake bite, we want to know the most concerning thing is going to be respiratory depression. On the other side of that, the most severe effect of a crotalid bite is going to be DIC. So we really want to know. Sea snake bite, it's going to be respiratory depression. Crotalid bite, it's going to be DIC. Next up here, when do ductal dependent lesions typically present? This is going to be within the first two to 10 days of life. So really important, if you have a, a neonate, they're coming in, they're hypoxic, they're cyanotic, they're having a hard time breathing, looks like heart failure, all of these different things. If they're coming in within the first two to 10 days of life, we want to be thinking about ductal dependent lesions because that is when that ductus arteriosus is starting to close and these patients are starting to have those symptoms. Is pulmonary capillary wedge pressure elevated in ARDS or CHF? This one's actually a bit of a trick because it's elevated in both. So you really want to know that. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is elevated in both ARDS and CHF. Last couple here to finish up. What is the most common cause of hemoptysis in the U.S.? It's going to be bronchitis. Most common cause of hemoptysis in the U.S. is bronchitis. And then what is the most common cause of hemoptysis in the world? It is going to be tuberculosis. So in the U.S., it's bronchitis. And it, throughout the entire world, it's tuberculosis. That's going to be it for this video. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed it, got some high-yield information out of it. I'm definitely going to be making multiple parts for this. So there will be a lot of information, hopefully, by the time the IT rolls around next year for you guys to review. Thank you so much for watching. As always, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you in the next video.